Charlie Parr is a folk and blues great, who still surprisingly flies under the radar for most. Today, that changes. On today's show, you're gonna be learning about Charlie, his approach to music, and his unique playing style. So go ahead and grab your guitar, tune up, and get ready for a stellar show. Hey TAC family, welcome to episode 246 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is designed to inject your guitar journey with a weekly dose of fun, focus, progress, and inspiration. A bit later on today's show, we'll be hopping in a time machine so I can answer some questions and address some comments from past Acoustic Tuesday episodes, one of which is indirectly from a founding member of the Birds. You'll see what I mean. You're also going to see which guitar lick the TAC family is working on today. It's entitled Bingo Bango. And of course, your weekly dose of acoustic news awaits, which includes a plane delay, some B bending, and much, much more. But first, let's take some lessons from Charlie Parr. If you've never heard of Charlie Parr before, today's gonna be a blast. If you're a longtime Charlie Parr fan, today is gonna be a blast because you're gonna get a look at his unique guitar style and his unique approach to learning music. Now, a little bit of background before we dig into the lessons. I interviewed Charlie, I think about six years ago at this point. And when he came in for the interview, I had never met him, I had never spoken to him other than to give him directions to the studio. Now, fast forward, uh, he is a dear friend of mine. We've played gigs together, we chat, we talk music, and it's really a cool relationship that was built from the guitar. And I'm very, very uh, extremely grateful for that. And in doing so, I feel like I have a, a really cool perspective on his style. Now, that being said, I'm not gonna teach you note for note how to play Charlie's songs. I'm quite simply going to introduce you to his style and some of his approaches. I don't play exactly like Charlie, and that's a good thing because each player has their own isms, their own uh, atmosphere around what they play, and that's a beautiful thing. But we can look at uh, Charlie's style objectively and, and pull some little nuggets out, and that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So let's go ahead and dive into the lessons. Lesson number one is learn with reckless abandon. Seek out guitar lessons wherever you can. If it's from a book, great. If it's from fellow players, great. If it's from a record, awesome. Seek out lessons and learn with reckless abandon and ignore mistakes. In fact, strike the word mistake from your vocabulary. We're gonna look at two videos. Uh, the first one is actually from the interview I did with Charlie some years ago, and he explains that he never had any formal lessons, however, He's learning things all the time. And the second video you're gonna see is his view about mistakes and why that word shouldn't even exist when it comes to learning the guitar. Is it the whole time? You never had a formal lesson, no, correct? No, I mean, in, in, in another sense, I, I had a lot of lessons because, you know, um, those records, um, later on when I was older and yeah. I could travel around, I went to Minneapolis and saw Spider John Kerner play. Yeah. Saw Dave Ray play. Yeah. Uh, other blues guitar players around the West Bank, like Pete Rikus and Dakota Dave Hull, and these guys. And you know, that's a lesson for me because I'm oh, s yeah. I'm like sitting there, you know, probably creeping them out. You know. <laughs> you know. And and they were gracious people. You yeah. Know? None of them really seemed to care. Sure. That I was sure. right there. So those are lessons. You know, when I was, when I was a teenager. You know, in Austin, and there was everybody was kind of playing in rock bands. You know, and I wasn't. I mean, I, I'm kind of. I like. I, li I like a lot of different kinds of music, and sure, all my sure. friends were into Sabbath, and I like Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. I really did. I wasn't really into playing it, mm -hmm. but I'd go and hang out at the park when everybody was playing, and I'd play a little bit, and like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, whatever. And then I'd watch them play, and you know, because I at that point I hadn't been playing in standard tuning. I'd been playing in open tunings because that's right. what the, you know, that's what I ended up at. I ended up yeah. in G most of the time. Right, so. right, right. And so, you catch things, and even today I'm like, you know, playing with people. I'm like, oh wow, you know, you're doing something weird, and I want to yeah. do that too. And so, those are my lessons. So, do you you know, feel if you're like... if you're super comfortable with the gear you're using, you can you can explore and make the sounds you want to make. Even if they're the sounds that, like, you know, whatever, you know, uh, method tells you that that's not correct, it doesn't matter because it's there's no correct. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, there's just different sounds. Um, 
Lesson number two is open tunings, specifically open G tuning. Now this doesn't mean that Charlie only uses open tunings. However, when he plays slide, he is most certainly in an open tuning and that open tuning happens to be open G. So real quickly, if you've got your guitar out, let me go ahead and show you how to get to open G tuning. First, you take your low E string, tune it down to a D. Next, your A string comes down to a G. Your D string stays the same. Your G string stays the same. Your B string stays the same. And your high E string goes down to a D. And if you strum all six strings, you get this wonderful G chord. This opens up the gateway to playing slide guitar, which is a lesson we'll get to a little bit later. Lesson number three is two finger picking. Now you just got a glimpse of how that looks, but I wanna give you a little bit of history as to why Charlie only plays with two fingers. And this topic came up when we were chatting during our interview. Here's what he had to say about it. A few years ago, um, I used to play with more fingers than this. Yeah. And I, I can't anymore because of, you know, muscle fatigue and whatnot. So okay. I, I just play with these two. I noticed and that. And so now part of my, Part of my practice is to bring songs up to speed that, that used to require more fingers and now yeah. I can't have them there. So finding shortcuts or finding ways to play songs that I really want in my repertoire that I could have played with all my fingers now that I need to learn how to play them with two and have them sound um, you know, decent. For and, sure, and not, for sure. Not either, not either to dumb them down or... I, I'll, I'm also not a big fan of like you know, uh, frillying things up just because you can, you know, right, so, right. and I can't anymore. So now I just like to have a nice, simple, clear presentation on certain things. So let's go ahead and see how this translates to guitar. Now I do have to say this, if you've never finger picked before, this is a great place to start because with just two fingers, you're going to see all the mechanisms that drive the technique of finger style guitar. And by just using two fingers, it really limits the variables. So you can focus on the basic technique. And those basic techniques are as follows. Thumb movement, index finger movement, and pinching using both the fingers together. Let's go ahead and work on each of those variables, each of those uh, technique mechanisms, if you will. So first let's work on thumb movement. All you're gonna do is bounce your thumb between the G string and the D string. Now remember, I'm using open G tuning here. So um, I'm using that lower G string and the middle D string. And all I want you to do is bounce back and forth between the two, like so. That's your basic thumb movement for finger style guitar. Now I want you to use your index finger on the B string and then the D string. Just bounce that back and forth. We got some thumb movement, we've got some index finger movement. Let's go ahead and combine them. When your thumb hits the low G string, your index finger is then gonna hit the B string. When your thumb hits the middle D string, your index finger is gonna hit the high D string. It's gonna sound like this. Now we have to integrate the pinch with it, which is just your thumb and index finger and uh, your thumb and index finger activating the strings at the same time. That would sound like this. And here I am uh, using the low G and the B string and the middle D and the high D. And you can combine those. You can go thumb, index, thumb, index, pinch, pinch, or really any combination. Pinch, thumb, index, thumb, index, pinch. You get the idea. It's a great way, again, to ease into the finger picking world and get those basic mechanics down. Lesson number four is use chord chunks. What the heck is a chord chunk? A chord chunk is a partial chord. And specifically, I'm talking about two note chord chunks. And I'm going to show you these in open G tuning because usually one of the first questions you get with open tunings is how do I play chords? Well, by virtue of an open tuning, you actually already know one 
and that is, in this case, a G chord. All you have to do is strum the open strings. Let me show you two other chord chunks, two note chord chunks. The first will be a C. A beautiful sounding C chord. Is this a pure C chord? No, because we're integrating some other notes. However, this is one of the chords that Charlie uses a lot in his playing. And this is an open G tuning, and this is a C chord. Okay, so your index finger will be on the first fret of the B string, and your middle finger will be on the second fret of that middle D string. And that's it. Pretty great sounding chord. Okay, let me show you another two chord chunk, and that is a D chord. And all you're gonna do for this one is use your ring finger on the third fret of the B string, and your index finger on the second fret of the G string, that middle G string. That'll sound like this. And that's kind of a, well, we'll call it a D-ish chord. Uh, so we have that open G, we have the C, and we have the D. And these, this might not seem like much. However, Charlie uses these to great advantage. And a great example is the song 1922 Blues. You're gonna see each of these shapes take place in the song. And I think it's amazing how much sound can come from these two chords when you pair this tuning, these chords, and Charlie's two finger picking style. Now before I get to lesson number five, I should mention that the song that you've been hearing is 1922 Blues, and it is an open G tuning, however it is capoed at the second fret. So if you're playing those chord shapes and things along with that song and you're thinking something's off here, make sure you have a capo on the second fret. Okay, that brings me to lesson number five, are we on? Yeah, we're on lesson number five, and that is use the one note drive. Yes, what is the one note drive? Well, if you listen to this song, you'll notice that Charlie addresses the melody, and then in between verses, whether he sings it or he plays it, he uses this kind of pulsing single note to occupy space. And I just love this technique because it makes something that is otherwise one dimensional, it turns it into something that has a little depth and has a little bit of dimension. Let me explain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and play the melody of the song and then use the one note drive. And then I'll play the melody of the song and then not use the one note drive. And you'll immediately hear the difference. That one note drive gives the song some pulse. Let me isolate what the one note drive is first so you know what you're listening for. Okay, here's what the one note drive sounds like. So that's the one note drive. If I was to count along with it, it would be one, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and. Okay, now I don't think Charlie plays it this way all the time. Um, he, he has, you know, he, he's a folk guitarist. So a lot of times uh, timing is skewed and emphasis is skewed and that's completely okay. It's part of uh, the beauty of Charlie's playing. So, but I'm trying to break this down so that, so that you can learn it and you can apply it to your own guitar journey. That's why I'm squaring it up by counting, counting along with it, counting, that's pretty funny. Anyways, so let me go ahead and show you the difference. Uh, I'm gonna play the melody and then use that one note drive and then I'll play the melody and not use it. And I think you'll see how effective it is. Okay, here's how it sounds. It's pretty apparent that without that one note drive, it gets pretty flat. There's no pulse, there's no dynamic. That's why lesson number five is to use the one note drive. Lesson number six is use a slide and play the melody. Yes, Charlie is known for his slide guitar playing and what I think is so effective about his slide guitar playing is that 
he nails the melody. He emphasizes the melody of his song. It's not that he's out to play all these flashy licks. It's the fact that he's reinforcing the melody of the song with his slide. It's extremely, extremely effective. Now, the song that comes to mind that he does this oh so well in is the song Remember Me If I Forget. He does a great passage in which he uses the slide to accentuate the melody. Here he is playing it. I'll go ahead and slow that down for you so you can play through it and see how truly effective it is. Now, the beautiful thing about this passage is that it takes place on the 12th fret, the 7th fret, and the 5th fret, and then open strings. Okay, so what we're gonna do is start out at the 12th fret and basically pick the melody out of that position. So the slide will essentially reside right over the 12th fret and you'll be picking the melody notes out. It'll sound like this. Lesson number seven is seek out the weird. And I'm talking about music to listen to, but I'm also talking about instruments to play. Now, I'm not saying that uh, resonator guitars are weird by any means, but if you look at Charlie's guitar collection, it's pretty uh, wide ranging, if I do say so myself. He's got a, a Mule's Tricone resonator. Uh, he had at one point a Mule Woodbody seven string resonator, which I believe was donated to charity at one point. He's got a Mule Mavis. He's got a Fraulini 12 string guitar. He also has this really cool electric jazz master type guitar with a pickup behind the bridge. That sounds ridiculously cool. So yeah, he embraces the weird and that's not just limited to what he listens to, it's also including what he plays. Lesson number eight is be in the moment. And I have two stories to tell and I'll keep them brief, but Charlie is one of those people that is so present and is so in the moment, it is admirable, it is inspirational. Uh, on two different occasions, I noticed this. Uh, one was we were playing a show at Pine Creek Lodge here, uh, which is just uh, one town over from Bozeman. It's like a 30 minute drive. And it's an outdoor show, it's very cool. And this was one of the first times I played with him an entire set. And he doesn't write a set list because he just wants to play what he wants to play. Now I'm not speaking on his behalf, this is just what I experienced. And all the subsequent times I've played with him, it's been the case. Just kind of play what you play, what you feel like playing, what, what the room dictates you play, or what the venue or the, the crowd, I should say. Uh, the second time I noticed that uh, Charlie was incredibly in the moment was we played a show at the Elm here in Bozeman. And prior to the show, um, I, I like to drink coffee. Charlie likes to drink coffee. And we're in the green room, and neither of us can figure out how to work this fancy coffee maker. You know, I, I, I'm a one button coffee maker type of person as I believe Charlie is. And we tried and tried and right before the show, he's like, hold on, I gotta go get the coffee maker out of my van. He goes, <laughs> he goes to his van, brings up this, this camping coffee maker and proceeds to, to brew us both one of the best tasting uh, cups of coffee I ever had. So while it's not necessarily musical in nature, it shows his approach to playing and that is just be, be there, be present, because it really comes across as a genuine musical experience. It's, it's really something that I can't even describe. In fact, a genuine musical experience doesn't even, doesn't even come close to describing how powerful being in the moment is. Lesson number nine, play more. Yes, play more. That's it. You know, when I interviewed Charlie, I asked him what advice would his current self give to his younger self? And his answer was to play more. Here's exactly what he said. You were looking at, you know, the 16, 17 year old Charlie Parr. What advice would you give him in terms of playing the guitar, getting better, playing out? Play more. 
play more. Because <laughs> yeah. when I was 16, you know, my, my, you know, he's 16, you, and I don't think it would have been possible because six, you know, teenagers, and I've got one now, and it, yeah. you know, your attention span, it's like, oh, girls, <laughs> oh, guitars, oh, computers, you know, whatever yeah. you're into. I, I don't think that there'd be any advice that I could give myself that I would have taken. Right. Um, but that's still my advice for people. They ask me, you know, yeah. what I think they should do, and it's just play. Play all the time. Play as much yeah. as you can. Play and, and take good care of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lesson number 10 comes from the songwriting world. Lesson number 10 is celebrate the common. This is Charlie's superpower, plain and simple. Charlie writes these wonderful songs about seemingly everyday occurrences but they're profound and they're deep because of the perspective he shares on these everyday occurrences. A couple examples are a song off of his most recent album, uh, Everyday Opus. It's strikingly beautiful, yet fairly commonplace. I don't even know if that's fair to say. I don't wanna put my foot in my mouth here, but it's, a, it's, it's the story of a day in the life type of figure. And it's, it's, really, it's really beautiful. Uh, another one, Cheap Wine, is another fantastic kind of a celebration of the everyday. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying I know what these songs mean. I'm not even saying that this was Charlie's intent in writing them. I just say, or I'm just saying that if you look at the songs he has written and you look at the lyrics, he has this beautiful way of, of describing Everyday Occurrences, A Scrapyard Bus Stop is another one. I, I could go on and on, but really reading his lyrics, um, it's just, it's something you ought to do because it just shows that you can take songwriting really in any direction. And oftentimes, topics for songwriting are around you all the time. Bonus lesson, lesson number 11 is embrace the folk process and have reverence for those that have come before you. Uh, this topic came up a couple of times when I was interviewing Charlie, and at one point I asked him if he felt like he was a torchbearer in the folk and blues realm, and his answer was so dead on, and it does show that he has extreme reverence for the artists that have come before him, that have helped shape this music, and he also embraces the process in which these songs change and grow uh, generation after generation. Here's what he said. It's really, I thought it was quite profound. You know, settling into the way I play and just yeah. feeling comfortable with it and not not letting myself be bullied into thinking that I have to do stuff a certain way. Right. But I can bring what it is that I have to the table, even if it's not that great. Here I am at the table with my plate. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm doing it anyway. Um, I don't think I'm any kind of a torchbearer. I really don't. I, I think I'm another member of the gang of people who okay. are doing exactly what I'm doing and, right. you know, bringing the folk process forward a little bit it's a it's a it's a pretty big group yeah you know yeah and i'm i feel lucky to be part of the group that's so i, I really hope you enjoy these lessons and if any of these lessons resonated with you uh, let me know which one it was in the comments below also if you just want to throw out your favorite charlie parr song uh, you can do that in the comments below as well Keep your guitar out, do not put it away. You're about to see what the TAC family is working on today. Every day within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, we focus on one of the five essential categories of guitar improvement. On Mondays, there's a technique challenge, Tuesdays, a guitar lick challenge, Wednesdays, an improvisation challenge, Thursdays, a rhythm guitar challenge, Fridays, a chord transition challenge. <gasps> and today happens to be Tuesday, so the TAC family is working on a guitar lick, and here's what they're working on today. Your guitar lick challenge for today is entitled Bingo Bango. It's a great descending lick in the key of G that has two distinct uses. The first is an ending to a song. The second is more of exposure to a rhythm that isn't all too common, but we can achieve using pull-offs or hammer-ons, and that is a series of 16th notes that really opens the gateway to musical phrases and how we can use musical phrases within a solo or within a single note passage to create interest. I'll get there in a bit, but first, let's go ahead and listen to the lick so you know what you're getting yourself into. Here's how it sounds. As you can tell, it's kind of uh, uh, almost choppy in a way. And you can hear some distinct musical phrases. You have the first one. 
the second one. And that, I kind of extended that last one, but the second musical phrase is kind of this. All right, so we have. And just a great exposure to this idea of little musical nuggets we can chain together. We'll get to some more details here in a moment. Uh, Tack fam, to learn this note for note, please log in. This is your daily challenge for today. Uh, click start challenge, you'll go immediately to the teaching video. Once you get through that, move to the play along video. Pick a speed that works for you today, and then don't forget to click on that tab icon in the lower right hand corner so you can open up that tab right next to the video. Okay, so what's the deal with this lick? As I mentioned, it has two distinct uses. As written, as I played it already, it's a great way to end a song. And uh, as you can see, it ends on this, this wonderful closed position G chord, but you can end it on an open G, you can end it on a regular G. Uh, if you end it on an open G note, that would sound like this. doesn't have as uh, full bodied of an ending, but certainly useful. And then of course, as I mentioned, you can move to that, that open G chord as well. A lot of different options there. But really what I wanna drive home with this lick is the use of musical phrases. And using this wonderful set of 16th notes to kind of uh, start our musical phrases with a nice capital letter and then a longer drawn out note, a quarter note in this case, to end the musical phrase, to add a period to the end of the musical phrase. As I showed you before, uh, I separated it into two different musical phrases. The first one being this, and the second one being this. It's kind of a third one, that, that last single note. But I isolated those two phrases because they do contain 16th notes. And one of the great ways we can use those 16th notes is to kind of start a phrase fast, a very attention getting series of notes, and then slow down as we arrive at an anchor note or a landing note. Uh, the way I'm achieving these 16th notes is pull-offs. One, E, and, a. Uh. And that's how you would count a series of 16th notes. And I just wanted you to see this in action. This really opens up a lot of possibilities. And I want you to almost hop in the helicopter and zoom out here and ask yourself the question, how can I use musical phrases when I create guitar licks? How can I use musical phrases when I play a guitar solo? You know, a lot of times when we play a guitar solo, we run into this wall where we feel like everything we play sounds like a scale, just note for note, very even, um, kind of a flat lined, if you will, not in a negative way, but as a necessary stepping stone to get comfortable playing a guitar solo. Well, one of the ways we can shake that up is by integrating different rhythms. Here's a great example of using 16th notes to spice up those single notes and almost create a little bit more movement. Okay, uh, so there you have it. That's your lick for today. Something that I really hope you enjoy. And again, like I said, something that I hope and I hope opens up. I hope and uh, something that I hope opens up some different creative possibilities for you. Okay, um, as 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 we get back into the show here, I just want to plant a little seed in your brain. You know, I talk about celebrating small wins quite a lot, and the importance of small wins goes well beyond just feeling good. Although that feeling good is tied to the main importance of celebrating small wins. If you want a habit to stick, if you celebrate a small win, you will associate good feelings with that habit. And when you make that association, you're that much more likely to continue that habit. Your habit is your guitar routine. When you celebrate your small wins after a playing session, you associate good positive emotions with the act of doing that habit, your guitar routine, which means you're that much more likely to continue your guitar routine. So I challenge you today or after your next guitar playing session to think of one small win. Think of one thing that went well during your playing session. Maybe it's the fact that you showed up. Maybe it's the fact that your guitar sounded awesome. Maybe it's the fact that you accomplished what you were working on. Whatever the case may be, find something positive from your playing session because those positive emotions will perpetuate your guitar routine.
As promised, we're gonna hop in a time machine. Yes, we're gonna visit some questions and comments from past Acoustic Tuesday episodes. So please uh, put your flight suit on, uh, including your helmet, and go ahead and securely fasten your seatbelt. We're gonna head back to episode 239 where I talked about harmonics. This comment comes from John Vickers Ziarnik. Hopefully I said that correctly. Thank you, Tony. I have followed you off and on for years. I live in the Andes of Peru with the worst internet in the world. This is why I have never joined the club or subscribed to your lessons. I found this segment and just finished watching the lesson on harmonics and it blew me away. I have wondered for years how so many I have watched are hitting harmonics all over the neck. The theory is what I have never found. You made my year with this lesson. But the true happiness comes from the newly found tingling harmonics I have wanted to discover on my K14 CE beyond the 5th, 7th, and 12th frets. I am blown completely away by utterly by how utterly and insanely simple it is. When I get tired of loving this finally discovered process on the K14CE, I will go to my new Tele Ultra, which I'm equally blown away with. I cannot thank you enough for showing everyone, and especially me, how insanely easy harmonics really are to play. So freaking simple. Uh, John, thank you so much for watching, and I'm so glad you dug that lesson, and I'm so glad that your internet was good enough so that you could take that lesson on that Acoustic Tuesday show. And for those of you who are wondering what he's talking about, on episode 239, I did an episode on how to play harmonics, step by step, and not just the naturally occurring harmonics. I, I taught you how to play artificial harmonics over chord shapes and things like that. So uh, make sure to check that out if you're interested. And again, John, thank you for watching. Uh, next comment comes from that same episode from Rick Rutherford. He says this, Hey Tony, another great show. My guess by looking at the episode number is that you're approaching the five year mark for the Acoustic Tuesday show. I was just wondering as a bit of nostalgia how Noah and Levi are doing these days. Can you provide an update for those of us who have been around for the entire ride with you? Thanks. Uh, yes, Rick, thank you so much for asking. I'm not actually sure what episode we're on. I don't know what when we, uh, I don't know what year we're on, but I can tell you this. Actually, I just looked it up. I'm, I'm looking at it right here. <laughs> and, and by virtue, it just popped up on my screen when I clicked one link. Um, the first Acoustic Tuesday show occurred on August 29th, 2017. Yes, that was my birthday. Well, August 29th is my birthday. I wasn't born in 2017. But yeah, the Acoustic Tuesday show started on August 29th, 2017. And I'm happy to report for those of you who have been with me from the beginning, been with the Acoustic Tuesday show from the beginning, Noah and Levi are doing absolutely fantastic. Noah does not live in Montana anymore, but I do keep in touch with him. And Levi and I hang out pretty much every week, multiple times per week. So yeah, everybody is alive and kicking and doing very well. All right, the next comment comes from a, a uh, earlier episode, episode 237. Uh, it was an episode where I talked about lessons from the birds, not the flying things, but the musical band, the birds. It comes from Long Tall J. And he says, essential stuff, Tony, thanks. What's your favorite plectrum these days? Cheers. Well, I prefer the blue chip TAD1R80. Okay, I'll say that one more time. The blue chip TAD1R80. It's a very thick blue chip pick, but I absolutely love it. I love the tone. I think I have about six of them now, um, just because I'm always fearful I'm gonna lose one. Uh, and I, yeah, I love them. I love them, love them, love them. Uh, prior to that, I used the Dunlop Altex 2.0. Um, Still a fan of that, but the blue chip the blue chip overtakes it by a mile. I just love the tone those picks produce. And the final comment comes from episode 240, which was my list of uh, my favorite Santa Cruz guitars. It comes from Terry Mattingly. He says this, I'm biased, but the Norman Blake D12 slotted and wider neck needed to be on the list to get a bigger finger style monster in the list. Now, I'm not sure that Santa Cruz Guitar Company ever made a Norman Blake model, but your comment made me uh, very curious. So I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check the records to see if they ever did make a Norman Blake uh, 12 fret dreadnought because I would certainly be interested in checking that out. Nonetheless, uh, he keeps going. He says, also, how do I reach you to let you know what a founding member of the birds thought of your birds lesson video? Well, holy smokes, that's, 
flattering, I think. Well, uh, hopefully, hopefully the thought was a good thought. It might have been a negative thought, but either way, I want to know. So, Terry, um, if you do the Instagram thing, that's probably the best way to reach out to me. Just go ahead and send me a direct message via Instagram. It's tac.guitar. And then you can also, of course, um, reach out via email, info at tonypolacastro.com. I'll see uh, either of those messages. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'll, I'll do a follow-up report on that. Um, oh, guys. Gosh, speaking of flight suits, uh, let's hop out of the time machine and let's go ahead and pop into the Acoustic Tuesday private jet for our longest flight yet. Uh, yeah, make sure you bring a good book. We're going to head to Caldwell, ACT Australia, to visit guitar geek Glenn Webster and take a look at his guitar arsenal. Here's what he has to say about it. Hi, Tony. Here's my guitar arsenal, although not all are there. I love your show. I look forward to watching it every week and picking up new tips and recommendations. It's the best guitar geek show thus far. Wow, thanks so much. I've been a TAC member for about three years now. I really enjoy the lessons that you provide. Thank you for all that you do for us guitar geeks. Wow, thanks so much, Glenn. Uh, here's the lineup of his guitar arsenal. Rather, here is uh, the guitars he has in his guitar arsenal. Picture number one, the acoustics left to right in the back row. An Epiphone John Lennon signature EJ160. A Maton Tommy Emanuel CGP signature. EBG 808. That was the full model name there. Sorry. Uh, next, a Gibson Standard J45. He's holding his number one acoustic, a Taylor Masterbuilt K24 CE. An Epiphone EJ200 Vintage Series, a Taylor Built to Order Custom GS model, and a Martin DX Johnny Cash. The front row, left to right, a Martin 0028, a Maton Diesel Special Mini 12 string, and a Taylor T5Z. The next picture here are the electrics, left to right, the back row, Ingve Malmsteen Signature Fender Strat an Eric Clapton signature Fender Strat, a Gibson Chet Atkins CEC nylon string. He's holding his number one electric, a Gibson Chet Atkins Country Gentleman. Next, a Gibson Angus Young signature SG, a Fender Player Series Telecaster, and a Fender Pink Paisley Telecaster. The front row, a Fender Steve Harris Precision Bass, a Gibson 1957 reissue Les Paul Gold Top, a Gretsch Chet Atkins Country Gentleman, an Ibanez Gem, a Hofner HTC 500-1, Base, an Eastman T486, and an Ibanez Nita Strauss. Holy smokes, Glenn, that is one heck of a lineup. I was stumbling over my words because I kept seeing all these signature models, and I'm like, man, that's cool. You got a heck of a guitar arsenal, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for sharing your guitar arsenal. And if you're sitting at home thinking, you know, Glenn did it, I can do it too. Uh, you can, you can submit your guitar arsenal, and I will feature it on a future Acoustic Tuesday show. All you have to do is this. I want to propose to you a win-win-win scenario. I want to feature you on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Yes, I want to feature you and your guitar arsenal, or you and your Acoustic Tuesday merchandise. Step number one, go to tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. Once you're there, pick out your favorite guitar arsenal shirt, your favorite Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, get it shipped directly to your door. Step number two, once your merchandise arrives, go ahead and put it on and take a picture of yourself, either just wearing Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, or if you have a guitar arsenal shirt, take a picture in front of all of your guitars. And then once you're done with that, step number three is to upload your picture at tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. There's a link right on that page. Click it, you can upload your photo, and boom, you'll be featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number one, you get featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number two, you get some cool snazzy Guitar Geek merchandise. Win number three, the biggest win of them all, all proceeds from the TonyPolacastro.com forward slash shop are being donated to Guitars for Vets. You get featured in the show, you get cool new shirts, cool new merchandise, and you help out Guitars for Vets. Win, win, win. Okay, back to the show. It's now time for your weekly dose of acoustic news you can use. And we have a fitting kickoff for today's news list. Yes, it comes from Charlie Parr. He released a new music video for his song, Bed of Wasps, which is on his most recent album. So let's go ahead and take a look at that music video right now. I would lose track of the path I was on When I float away I simply find another one why is it so hard to see past your own nose? Time is an illusion, so it goes. Please don't let her leave. I know she won't be back again. 
Obviously that was just a snippet of the video, but as you can tell, it's a pretty awesome music video. And it's one of those music videos that reflects the story of the song very well. It's a real treat to watch, so I encourage you watch the entire thing. Next up on my list is a post I saw on Facebook. And it comes from Tim Stafford. So for those of you who don't know who Tim Stafford is, he is a phenomenal flat picking guitarist. And he happened to write the book, or co-write the book, um, Still Inside, The Tony Rice Story. Great book, it's always here on my desk. In fact, this is a signed copy. If you haven't read this book, check it out. Um, that's besides the point, but kind of related. Uh, so talking about Tim Stafford, I follow him on Facebook and he just posts this thing on what would have been Tony Rice's 71st birthday. Uh, here's what it says. And I think you'll be excited, especially if you like Tony Rice's music. Here's what it says. Uh, Today would have been Tony Rice's 71st birthday. He was simply the best at what he did. I worked last year and this year on a six disc compilation of Tony's music, which will be released in 2023 on Kraft Recordings, one of the largest and most storied collections of master recordings and compositions in the world. Daniel Mullins worked on two discs of material from the Bluegrass Album Band series, as well as, from, well, let me reread this. Daniel Mullins worked on two discs of material from the Bluegrass Album Band series as well that are included. I know Tony would have been pleased to see his work honored alongside his heroes like Miles Davis, Doc Watson, Bill Evans, James Taylor, Mongo, Santa Maria, and John Coltrane on craft. Here's to the greatest of all time. This was something that I just thought was wickedly cool. And uh, I could not believe that I was reading that. Um, so very excited. Mark your calendars for, well, I guess sometime in 2023. As I hear more, I will tell you about it. And certainly if you're a Tony Rice fan, your ears should have perked up pretty uh, pretty tall. Think think uh, uh, Doberman? Uh, Doberman's have pointy ears? I don't know. I'm not a dog guy. Anyways, um, speaking of Tony Rice, uh, I recently posted this picture of my son Emerson. And I wanted to share it with you for those of you who don't have Instagram. Um, his favorite t-shirt to wear right now is his Tony Rice t-shirt. Um, it is absolutely hilarious. Whenever I get him up in the morning and we're getting dressed, he's like, Tony Rice t-shirt, Tony Rice t-shirt. And uh, roughly six of the seven days of, of the week, I have to tell him, hey, bud, we, we already wore it. It's dirty. Once the laundry's done, you'll be able to wear it again. And I thought this was funny because my older son, Aiden, who's now 15, when he was Emerson's age, uh, he liked Tony Rice as well. I probably had something to do with this. Anyways, I remember taking Aiden over to a friend's house and my friend had this old Martin D35 hanging on the wall, well-worn D35. And as soon as we walked in the front door, Aiden pointed at it and he's like, Tony Rice's guitar? And I just thought to myself, that's my boy. Anyways, <laughs> moving right along. Um, a, fl a flight delay caused a beautiful mu musical moment. Musical? I said musical. A, a beautiful, magical, musical moment. <laughs> Sam Bush and his band were scheduled for a flight. It got delayed. What did they do? They jammed on the plane. All I have to say is I wish I was on that plane because it would have been the most joyful enjoyable flight delay probably ever. Uh, next up on my news list is a, a cross section of things that I love. Uh, those of you who watch the show may know, if you don't know, I'll confess right now, I am a huge Slipknot fan. Um, absolutely love the band and their new drummer, Jay Weinberg, I say new, he joined the band within the last four years five years maybe? I don't know, I'm losing track of time. Anyways, uh, Jay Weinberg, the current drummer for Slipknot, uh, is also a hockey fan who also happens to be a goalie. And he just got his mask painted. And uh, here's what he says in his post. I'll, you'll see some pictures here. He says, wow, this one deserves a big ol' are you kidding me? Thank you for the absolute, thank you to the absolute beauties. Jesse Pollock, uh, Vin Vincent Zeroni, some other, some other names, some other Instagram names I can't pronounce, uh, for this insane custom painted goalie mask. What an honor. A couple of my favorite things coming together. Doesn't get better than that. Very, very cool. Uh, congratulations on your new mask. I should get a mask painted. You know, I just realized I got this new glove and blocker uh, la during last season, and it's the tack colors. I got, it was a blue and yellow um, pro stock set. It was a, a Pecorine set, actually. Uh, pro stock hockey has these sets sometimes, and I got a glove and blocker, uh, blue and yellow, really cool. 
And as the season went on, I'm like, those are tack colors. How cool is that? Anyways, that wasn't intentional, but I thought it was cool. Uh, next up on my list is some news from Taylor Guitars. Yes, Andy Powers just stepped up and he is now the CEO at Taylor. How cool is that? Let me go ahead and read the post as you look at this picture. Uh, we're pleased to announce the promotion of Andy Powers to the roles of president and CEO at Taylor. Powers will also continue to lead Taylor's guitar development, assuming the new title of chief guitar designer, president, and CEO. Congrats to Andy and co-founders Bob Taylor and Kurt Listug for this exciting milestone that will lead us into the future with great guitar making at our core. Congratulations, Andy. That's awesome. A hell of an whoa, uh, hell hell of an honor there, and something that is worthy of celebration. So again, congratulations to you. Uh, next, I've got one more news item. Now, I was in Chicago. Uh, gosh, when was it? In May, sometime. May. What what month is it? I don't know. May. I was in Chicago in May. That's uh, when I picked up my Atkins guitar uh, for from. Um, Chicago Music Exchange, rather my Atkin guitar. Uh, and while I was there, I had a chance to meet Nathaniel Murphy. Uh, really cool, I posted a picture of it. If you didn't see it, I'll, I'll flash it up here now. But while I was there, Nathaniel was like, dude, you, you have to check out this old, uh, this Dove, this Gibson Dove that had a B-Bender in it. Yeah, let me just let me just set the record straight. A Gibson Dove, an acoustic guitar with a B-Bender. Now, I've seen B-Benders on acoustic guitars before. I've seen a Thompson Dreadnought with a B-Bender on it. I've never seen a vintage acoustic guitar with a B-Bender on it. This one had it, installed by none other than Gene Parsons. Way cool stuff, but it got even cooler. I had the chance to play this guitar, which was rad in and of itself. I kind of was a little dumbfounded. I was, I was playing this guitar, I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I'm, my, my brain is spinning between the B-Bender, it being a cool vintage guitar, and not really playing a B-Bender all that much, just kind of making weird noises. It was cool. Uh, a huge thanks to Nathaniel and Chicago Music Exchange for letting me play it. But uh, Nathaniel arranged the Led Zeppelin song, Cashmere, on it, and it is a treat to listen to. So let's go ahead and listen to a portion of it right now. wonderful B bent notes. I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today. But first, let's take a sneak peek into next week. And next week, it's going to be a lesson behind the lick segment. You're going to be learning the power of closed position and movable guitar licks and guitar chords. This quite possibly could be the most potent lesson I've ever taught on the Acoustic Tuesday show. It will be one not to miss. And remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time on YouTube. But again, be sure to mark your calendar for next week because next week's show is going to be a dandy, that is for sure. I want to thank you for joining me today, but I do want to remind you of one thing before I let you go, and that is this. Your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. That's why you started guitar, to have fun. So make sure you're having fun playing. It is vital to your guitar journey. Again, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers, and guitar geeks unite.